Hello, Kate. Hello, thank you. And let me check. Are you hearing me well with my headphone? Do you hear me? Yeah, you do hear me. Good. Excellent. Good. Good. Well, thank you. It's really lovely to be here. And it was actually wonderful to see that video of Hawkwood. Um, and so the, the, I have a fondness for getting a cup of tea in that kitchen. So um, it was lovely to see it again and, and looking forward to the days when we are able to return. So thank you so much for having me here today. And I'm honoured to be the first speaker kicking open these uh, days of discussion and, and so many people here bringing their questions and their, their projects and their life plans. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this session. So what I'm going to do is introduce the ideas of donut economics and then talk through what it would mean to apply that to your own enterprise, whether it's a business, an institution, a company. I'm going to talk through the lens of a company, but I invite everybody to listen through their own project for how we can design organizations to be fit for the 21st century. So I'm going to share my screen. Hang on a moment. Um, oh, I want to go over there. Here we are. Excuse me. Here we go. So when business meets the donut. So I want to just pull back from this Wednesday morning in February 2021 and just only go so far as the 21st century because we need to just recognize that the 21st century has begun with repeated and multiple crises from the financial meltdown of 2008 to the ongoing climate and ecological breakdown that we know is the context in which we live to the current COVID lockdown happening in almost every country in the world. And these crises tell us many things. They tell us that we humanity are deeply interconnected with each other and with the rest of the living world. They tell us that the inequalities and the impacts of these crises fall with sharp inequalities of gender and race, of wealth and power, of global north and global south. And they tell us that these crises actually emerge from the very systems that we've created. And I believe they all emerge from systems that presume and depend upon endless expansion. So if you create a financial system that expects and demands to endlessly expand, you will generate conditions for a subprime mortgage market. If you create a, a human energy system and industrial system that depends upon endless increase in fossil fuel use and material use, you induce climate breakdown and ecological collapse. If we create human settlements that endlessly expanding into areas of wildlife, combined with humanity endlessly traveling between nations by flight, we create the perfect conditions for zoonotic disease transfer in a global health pandemic. So these crises are a, a very, very valuable message to us that the systems we've created are generating their own profound disruptions that are indeed a massive disruption to human well-being. So I believe we need to reimagine the shape of progress. It is not endless expansion. Nothing in nature thrives by endlessly expanding. We need to move away from the notion of progress is endless growth to something more like this donut compass that I offer. It's thriving in balance. Now the aim here, imagine, imagine humanity's use of Earth's resources radiating out from the center of that picture. So the hole in the middle of the donut is a place where people are falling short on the essentials of life, where they don't have the food and healthcare, water, education, housing, energy, networks, gender equality, political voice, that every person has a claim to. They're lacking those key resources. We need to make sure everyone in the world has the resources they need to meet these essentials. And these are uncontrovertible. These are the 12 social priorities set out in the Sustainable Development Goals. The value of that is that all the governments in the world have already agreed that all people in the world have a claim to meeting these. So leave no one in the hole. But at the same time, there's a, another side to the story. We cannot use Earth's resources collectively so much that we push ourselves over that ecological ceiling because there we put so much pressure on the life supporting systems of our planet that we push our planet out of balance and we cause climate breakdown and we acidify the oceans and we create a hole in the ozone layer and we break down the web of life. And these nine issues around the outside are known as the planetary boundaries drawn up by earth system scientists only just over a decade ago. So this is very 
new to humanity, to be able to describe for ourselves in Western scientific terms, these life supporting systems on which the stability and health of life on this planet depend. It's worth knowing because it's everything that life depends upon. So when we put these two together, we want to leave no one falling short without overshooting the pressure. We need to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And that is the essence of this donut diagram. We want to live in the green, safe and just space for humanity in the middle. And if that's the goal, the shape of progress has dramatically changed already in just two slides. It's no longer this ever rising line of GDP growth, expansion, expansion, grow. It's thriving in balance like this between the inside and the outside. And just doing that with my hands, it's a heartbeat, right? It feels like life. It's a heartbeat of thriving in dynamic balance. And that's what we know health is. We know it in our bodies that health lies in being warm enough, but not too hot, having enough to eat, but not overeating, having enough water, oxygen, exercise, everything, enough, but not too much. That is where health lies in balance. And we need profoundly to take that understanding from the bodily metaphor, from the human body to the planetary body, because there I believe lies our greatest chance for thriving on the planet. So, Health and success lies in thriving in balance, but we are very, very far from that right now, as all the red in this picture shows. So billions of people worldwide can't meet their essential needs, and we are already in overshoot on the planet. Just bringing it home in some headlines, and I'm sorry to kick the morning off this way, but I'm not sorry because we need to just sit with the reality and then move into transforming it. So climate change is happening faster and sooner than forecast. That must mean that we need to act hard, faster and quicker and more dramatically than even the models and the plans have told us. There are microplastics in human and animal bodies the planet over. Children, uh, since 1970, so I'm 50 years old, so I was born in the end of 1970, so this is my little lifespan. Since the, the day I was born, the number of other animals other than humans and other, other animals living on this planet has fallen by nearly 70%. There are 70% fewer other animals on this planet while the human population has doubled. Children are breathing toxic air as we all are. Land degradation and water shortages are a very profound threat. Phosphorus pollution and ocean acidification not seen in 14 million years. And then the richest 1% of people own half of the world's wealth, which is the one I actually find it hardest to get my head around actually understanding that. We need a ray of light. There is a glimmer. I love this headline from NASA, hole in Earth's ozone layer finally closing up because humans did something about it. And that is the point. We can do something about all of this because all of this is a result of the systems we've designed and we can redesign them and remake them. And that's why we are here. So this is the challenge. It's at the global scale. Of course, most Policy making, most action doesn't happen at the global scale. In fact, that's one of, one of the reasons why these planetary boundaries have been overshot. So let's bring it down to the national scale. Research at Leeds University did a brilliant breakdown of the donut concept to 150 nations, and here's just three of them. So on the one end, we've got Malawi. Lots of red in the hole in the middle because Malawi is very much falling short on meeting the needs of all of its people. It's living on less than $1,000 per person per year but it's not overshooting its pressure on any of those planetary boundaries on a per capita basis worldwide. If every person had some sense of resource use, Malawi is living well within those means. China in the middle, it represents the situation of many countries, significantly falling short on multiple social dimensions, already overshooting multiple planetary boundaries. So it's got the double whammy challenge of dealing with both of those at the same time. And I'm using the, U the UK today because I believe many participants here in the UK it looks like the UK is almost filling in that blue circle. I'm just going to remind us that the blue circle in the middle is a very, very low globally, internationally comparable bar. So all high income countries should absolutely be smashing that. All high income countries should have a totally blue circle because they've got the UK is living on $44,000 per person per year. Should be totally filled in, it's not. Because we know that there is very significant um, deprivation and inequality in the highest income nations as well. So even in the high income nations, there's deprivation. But the UK is massively overshooting its pressure on the planet. And let me be clear that this pressure that's recorded here, that red, is not just the resources that are used and emitted within the UK, 
it's all the resources that are embedded in the products we consume. It's in the clothing and the electronics and the food we import and the construction materials and all the consumer goods we import. So those are three nations. Let me put them together now in a plot of over 100 countries. So the sweet spot where we want to be is that top left hand corner. That's where you've met the needs of all the people come up the screen, but do so within the means of planetary boundaries. And first of all, we can see that there's no country that can say they're anywhere close to having achieved that. So I would invite everybody to remind them never to call countries developed, developed countries. Uh, please, if you're ever going to use the word developed country, take me to one. I've never been to one because I can't see one here. So I think no country in the world has the right to say it's developed or it's advanced. We are all in a sense developing countries now. We are all on an unprecedented developmental journey. The low income nations have to meet the needs of all of their people for the first time ever without overshooting those planetary boundaries in the way that every nation before them has done. How will they do that? Middle income nations have a double whammy challenge of meeting people's needs for the first time, but already coming back within planetary boundaries. How will they do that? And high income nations where the vast majority of people on this call are sitting right now, have to meet everybody's needs for the first time, like do a better job with the very high level of income that these countries already have, but massively come back within planetary boundaries. That, like the others, is an unprecedented journey of transformation. So we also need to recognize that these nations may stand like little dots alone on the page, but they're deeply interconnected through histories of colonialism, the UK particularly, through policies of structural adjustment in the 1980s imposed by the World Bank and the IMF on low income nations, through current debt relations and trade rules, through ongoing resource extraction and land grabs, and through current and future climate change impacts that we know have been generated by the highest income nations but are going to fall hardest and first and heaviest on the lowest. So we need a transformation in every nation's journey, but also in the relationships between nations. This to me is the 21st century journey. And we should be checking in on this chart every 10 years. I mean, I would love the United Nations to have every country in the world have to report against this chart every 10 years, its own country's movement and its own country's role in transforming those relations between them. That would actually set us on a journey to getting into the donut. So I've talked now about the global story and the national story, but I'm going to bring it right down to the level of business because within most economies, the market plays a very important role and the actor within a market is an enterprise and an enterprise is structured like a business. So we need to understand what it is that businesses are doing and how they can be part of transforming this story. And I've actually had the fortune and the fascinating experience over the last nine years since The Donut was first published in 2012 of having many, many conversations with business around this donut table, either figuratively or literally, and inviting companies to put their products on the table and asking themselves, is the way that we're making money here, helping bring humanity into this space, is, is actually our business helping to meet the needs of all people? And are we helping to bring us back within the means of the planet? Or let's be honest with ourselves, actually maybe the way we've been doing business has been driving humanity and the planet out of this donut because that's what a lot of 20th, 20th century business did. So what's really, really fascinating is the, the extraordinary range of responses that I've heard from companies when they encounter the donut. And I call this the business to-do list. What is business going to do once it's confronted this picture of humanity's predicament now? So on the business to-do list, five different responses of what business is going to do. And the first one is the oldest, it's to do nothing. So the company might say, well, that's a very sad story. But you know, the business of business is business and everything we're doing is nearly legal. So we're just going to keep going until the cost of breaking those laws exceeds the profit we make from it. Well, that was actually, so Milton Friedman late in the 1970s, you know, said that the social responsibility of business is to do business, to make profits. And there is no room for this kind of business attitude anymore. It still exists, but we cannot tolerate it and we need to transform it. So the first step up is businesses, well, we'll do what pays now. I mean, if we'll save money in our supply chains by cutting carbon emissions, let's do it. And actually it turns out they save a load of money 
in the first couple of years of cutting those supply chain emissions because they're incredibly wasteful supply chains. If we'll get new niche customers by getting uh, some kind of green certification, then we'll do it. So this is moving in the right direction with, with more green, more social, but it's far too incremental and it's still framed within what pays immediately, what shows up on my short term profit loss. We'll never get there in time if we are that incremental. So we need to be more ambitious. The next step, and this was quite dominant last decade, actually, was a lot of narrative around, we'll do our fair share. So companies would say, well, our government has said we're going to cut our carbon emissions by 20% in 20 years. So we'll cut our carbon emissions by 20% in 20 years. We'll do our fair share. Nice. But the trouble with fair shareism is that it almost never adds up. And we all know this from being in a restaurant with a whole bunch of people and the everyone's buying drinks and dinner and the, and the waiter comes at the end of the evening with the bill. You don't really want to be the person who's gathering that cash because it very often doesn't add up. Or what we've seen at the world climate change negotiations is nations haggling. Well, we'll do our fair share when you do your fair share, but you're not going to do your fair share till they do their fair share. So fair shareism rarely adds up. But what's happened in just the last couple of years is the world scientists have said, well, hang on, if nations want to do their fair share, it turns out that your fair share, now that we know the science, your fair share actually kicks us up to the next level of ambition because your fair share is to do zero emissions. By, the question is by when? Should you have zero emissions by 2030, 2050, 2025, 2040? So to do emission zero is another level of ambition to say, we will have net zero carbon emissions in our supply chain. We will put no polluted water back into the river. We will have no child labor in our supply chains. We will have no dangerous accidents at work. So mission zero is transformative because business hasn't been done like this before. But as the regenerative designer Bill McDonough would say, why, why aim to be 100% less bad? Like, why would you do that? We're gonna do absolutely no harm. Why would you stop there? Why would you not break through the ceiling of your imagination and actually do good? Be generative be regenerative. And this one I call doing the donut because there are some companies that when they see the donut diagram, they literally go, oh, but, but that, that could be our logo. I mean, that's why we exist. We exist to sequester carbon. We exist to build community health. We exist to bring about education for the marginalized. We're just using business because we can see it can be really effective vehicle for achieving that. So there's this full range out there of the corporate to-do list. And so how are we going to ask ourselves, what would it actually look like to do the donut, right? So what would it mean to say you're going for the top? So what would it take to do business in the donut? I believe we need to create two transformative dynamics to be regenerative and distributive by design. And I'll explain what I mean by each of those. So we've inherited degenerative industrial systems based on this idea. We take us materials, we make them into stuff we want, we use it for a while, and then we throw it away. And this take, make, use, lose, this is what pushes us over the cycles of life. And this is what it looks like when we take again and again and again from Earth's sources. And this is what it looks like when we throw our waste again and again and again into Earth's sinks, our plastics into lakes and rivers and electronic waste into the neighborhoods of the world's poorest people. And I sincerely believe that your grandchildren and mine will pull photographs like this from the archive and they'll tap us on the shoulder and they'll say, did you know about did you ever see this? Because they will see it for what it is, which is extraordinary disrespect for the living world and our fellow humans. Because by the time that they are pulling those photos from the archive, we will have transformed this. We will have bent those linear arrows around and we will have created a circular or cyclical economy in which resources are used again and again. This is an economy which restores and works with and within the cycles of the living world. So we are separating biological nutrients, anything that's made by nature that decomposes and turns back into materials for life. And we've separated that from technical nutrients, things like, um, oh, plastics and ceramics and rubbers and metals or synthetics or human made materials that we need to mimic nature cycles. We need to restore them and repair them and reuse and refurbish. And only as a last resort, recycle and minimize what's being lost. So I believe this will be an economy that runs on renewable energy. And the core principle here is that the waste from one process is food for the next. There's no such thing as waste. It's a raw material in the wrong place. 
How do we get it to the right place and use it again? I believe this economy will need to be modular by design so that things can be taken apart and fixed and just that piece that's broken can be repaired. And that will shift from a model of ownership, owning washing machines and cars to sharing and renting and borrowing. What could this look like in practice? Well, first I want to say that let's be clear that regenerative design isn't the same as sustainable. So let's just think of three different designs. And this, this is a lovely image from Interface Carpets who I'll tell you about in a moment. So degenerative design, what we're leaving behind, the factory is a smokestack with pollution going in the sky. It was a take make waste system and it, the products were carbon intensive. Now the sustainable, which you could say is mission zero, 100% less bad, the factories go to zero, mission zero, we've got no carbon emissions. We've closed the loop, we're using our materials again and again, and we've got low carbon products. But to go to regenerative is another step, which is to say, actually, how could the factory give off oxygen and life and be part of the living world rather than doing no harm, it's generous like the forest. How can we make products that actually reintegrate materials that are already dispersed? We are encountering the world in a degraded state. So how can we run a business that actually helps restore and repair it? How can we create products that sequester carbon rather than just don't release it? Now, interface carpets have been on this journey. So they began as in the 1990s, they were a do-nothing company. Yeah, we make carpets. Until employees started asking, what are we doing on sustainability? And the CEO, Ray Anderson, uh, he, he read Paul Hawkins' book, uh, Natural Capital. He learned about cradle to cradle. He said it was like a stake through my heart. He had an epiphany and he realized that he had been destroying the living planet and he committed to turning this around. So he set his company off on mission zero. And this is one of their, their carpet factories in New South Wales. He said, we're gonna be 100% relying on new renewable energy by 2020, which at the time sounded insane. It was crazy. But now of course it, we, we can say, yeah, and we expect that. He said, we will recognize that the waste from our products, it's food for the next. So they began going back and reclaiming the carpets. You know where a carpet is, it's where you left it. You can go and get it and you can separate the fibers from the bitumen. You can use materials again and you can pass other materials off as food for another industry. They had a over 90% drop in factory waste since 1996. So he transformed it. But he then also saw and, and interface carpets have said, hang on, mission zero, nature doesn't do zero. Nature doesn't work in zeros. Nature regenerates. Nature gives back. That's how she belongs and that's how she supports ecosystems around her. So now they've moved on to the next level. First of all, they're reintegrating dispersed products from the world. So rather than just creating new nylons, they're, they're buying used fishing nets from Filipino fishermen, catching them out the sea, turn these into carpets. Let's reintegrate these materials and save them from the natural world. But also they're saying, well, where is our factory? This factory is in New South Wales. What is nature's generosity here in New South Wales? And this is the work of the biomimicry designer, Janine Benyev. So Janine says, well, let's go to the wild man next door. Let's go and see the forest of New South Wales and let's take its metrics. How much carbon dioxide does this forest sequester? How much groundwater does it store? How much does it purify the air and clean, create soil and cool the climate and house biodiversity? And what if we took those metrics as the ambition for the performance of the factory? So these have become ecological performance standards. How could we make a factory that actually sequesters carbon too, that stores groundwater and purifies the air and also creates soil and cools the climate and houses biodiversity so that that factory acts as if it was part of the forest. And that's the journey they're on and they're in the middle of creating that design now. So this for me is the shift from saying sustainable, 100% less bad, to generative and regenerative actually giving back and belonging within the cycles of the living world. So that's from degenerative to regenerative. And then we've got from divisive enterprise, which we've inherited, which designed to capture as much value as possible for those who are in the enterprise. Should sound familiar, 20th century business corporations ran like this and are celebrated for succeeding like this. So creating enterprise actually that's distributive by design so that it shares the value that's created far more equitably with everyone who helps to create that value. Some examples, and these are illustrations of illust uh, distributive enterprise. There's many ways of doing it. Employee ownership. So one big company in the UK that everyone's heard of is Waitrose John Lewis. It's owned by 17,000 employees. And here they are uh, holding up a, a number saying 17%, that was their 17% profit share that year that went to all of the employees in the company. So rather than the, the 
profits going to shareholders who've never actually stepped inside the office or stores or factory. It's going to the people who actually work there. But also we obviously need to care not just about the people who show up on the premises of the business, but who supplied all the goods that are being sold. So thinking about living wages throughout supply chains. What if a company said, we have committed to paying living wages throughout our supply chains before we're paying any more shareholder dividends? That would be a radical move and that would be distributive. And actually Unilever just this last month have committed, I think, I think by 2030, they've said, we are going to pay living wages throughout our supply chains worldwide. That's that's a really notable shift by a very large company aiming to be distributive by design, given its structure. Open design. This looks like a rock concert. Actually, it's a software developing conference. They are creating Drupal, which is an open source software that's used then to make uh, web websites and platforms. And they're all holding up their fingers to say, you know, I may be but one drop, but look what happens when we get together. We create an incredible wave. And any major corporation would be hugely envious of the size and the passion of this research and development team. These people are co-creating a commons, which is a digital commons, and then building small market niche enterprises off of it. So it's the market commons overlap, but it's distributive of the intellectual property that's created. And then the fair tax commitment. Companies like Lush have signed up to paying fair tax. What does that mean? It means paying the right amount of tax at the right time in the right place. Whereas we know that most companies spend a lot of money on accountants who help them pay the least amount of tax in as few countries as possible, as little as possible. So it's about recognizing that business only succeeds when society succeeds and business needs to give back to society. So I would invite you to ask yourself, where is the enterprise that you're thinking of, whether it's a multinational that you work for, a small uh, brewing company you're setting up in your shed, where are you on the corporate to-do list? And what I often hear when I'm talking to companies is people will say honestly, well, actually you know, the CEO speaks as if we're doing the donut, but you know, really middle managers are actually just incentivized to do what pays now. Or, well, we're doing a lot on climate, but mm, human rights, that's not really our thing. So I would invite you to take that idea away and, and, and ask yourself, honestly, across our company, where are we and how do we move? We don't have time to go incrementally up, we need to leap. But the really big question is this, how can we do business in the donut? We, how do we become distributive and regenerative design? What really matters is not the design of a company's products or its factories. What sits behind all of that is the design of the business itself. And I believe we are in the middle of an extraordinary transformation of the design of business. We've inherited 20th, 20th century extractive enterprises that ask this one overriding question, how much financial value can we extract from this enterprise? And yet when you see people who are dancing in the possibility of what business can be, they're asking a completely different question. How many benefits can we generate through the way that we run design enterprises? What is it that leaves some companies stuck on one side while others are dancing in that space of new possibility. And I think it's five key design traits that I learned from the brilliant analyst, Marjorie Kelly. The first one is purpose. What is the purpose of your enterprise? Why does it even exist? What is it in service to? One company that's really been on a big journey with purpose is Dong Energy, Danish oil and natural gas. Big oil rig in the sea. They must have had some fascinating conversations in their boardroom about who they wanted to be and what purpose they wanted to serve because they decided quite early to get 100% out of oil and gas and become 100% a renewable energy. So they sold all those old assets and gone all the way into wind power and so had to rename themselves Ørsted, which is after the man who invented the, the um, electromagnetism. So they really transformed their purpose and they did it, if you think about it, by looking up a level. So we, we, we think we're an oil and gas company, but actually if we look up a level, we can be an energy company. How can we jump from degenerative to regenerative energy? We can still be an energy company, but we completely reinvent ourselves. So sometimes the key to purpose is looking up a level and seeing how you can transform. Second, networks. Who are your customers and your suppliers and your members of your ecosystem? And what do they share your values and purpose? And do they help hold you to it? Good Energy, a uh, UK 100% renewable energy company that many people here may know, has done a really good job of building its networks. It, it's part funded by its customers, uh, some of its suppliers are its customers. It works in an ecosystem with others who are bringing about the electric vehicle revolution and the electric energy revolution. And they help, and it sends newsletters all the time. So it keeps itself true to its value. So this Good Energy suddenly said, actually, we've decided we're gonna buy an oil rig. Its entire network would turn around and say, oh, excuse me, or what, right? So its, it's networks would help hold it to its values and it helps spread those values through its networks. Governance, 
huge area here, the principles and practice, the metrics and incentives, the culture and the norms of how a company is run. And of course, it's pulling against the 20th century model of share, corporate shareholder run companies where the quarter is king. They say the quarterly report every quarter. You talk to a chief financial officer every quarter. I need to prove to shareholders that we've got growing sales, growing profits and growing market share. That is really how the company ends up being governed around those metrics. There's no room for transformation. So you need to escape from those metrics. Now, Paul Pullman was famous on his first day of becoming CEO of Unilever. In that context, he said, well, we're not going to be slaves to these shareholders. So he said, we're not going to issue quarterly reports anymore. We'll only issue them every half year, still every half year. If you want quarterly reports on your sale or on what's happening to your, your share price, you're in the wrong company. We're here for longer term transformation. But others have gone different routes. So B Corporation writes into the Articles of Association of the company that we are here not only for shareholder returns and for profit, but for social environmental value. So it writes it in as a protection against any, the idea that any shareholder could come along and say, you're not delivering, I'm your, I own you and you're not delivering me maximum returns. Or some companies do a balance sheet assessments against the economy for the common good, which is a very stringent test of their social and environmental um, structure and design. And some cities even, such as Hamburg, say companies that have assessed themselves on the common good balance sheet, if you've got a good enough score, we give you subsidies and preferential treatment as a business. So they're encouraging businesses that they want to see in their city. So purpose networks governance down to the deeper stuff. How is the enterprise owned? Because if it's owned by shareholders or pension funds or the state or private equity or venture capital, that's probably going to give a different lean to whether it's owned by impact investors or family or crowdfunding or employees or the state. Now, I'm not saying that these are rigidly on one side or the other. It's a spectrum. But what matters about why how a company is owned really matters is the impact that has on finance and what finance where finance is coming from and what that finance is demanding and what happens to the distribution of profits so when we have companies that are owned in extractive ways finance wants short and high financial returns i want a fast return on my share and the profits that are generated are largely channeled to the owners whereas when we have generative enterprise the finance is seeking long value creation. It's got a holistic vision. I want, I want a fair financial return, but I'm also investing in you because of the social environmental value you create. And much more of the profits will be reinvested re, uh, in that purpose. So in, in, in furthering the intention of the very enterprise itself, because it's in service to transformation. So what we often see in the world, and if you're looking in the world of big business particularly, what you'll see is companies that I have this sort of split design and I'm gonna use Unilever here because it's a very public example. So Paul Pullman, who I respect as a CEO, he came in, he introduced a real purpose to Unilever, sustainable living plan. He, he joined new networks of companies that were progressive and transforming. He wrote new metrics into the governance. He said, we're not going to give shareholder reports every quarter. So he did a lot on transforming purpose networks and governance, but the company is still owned by mainstream stockholders. And that's why in 2018, there was suddenly a hostile takeover bid of Unilever, whereas Heinz and Kraft Heinz and 3G Capital said, hang on, Paul Pullman is leaving a lot of value on the table, meaning he's giving it to other people in the supply chain. He's paying it to workers. He's giving it to the environment. He's leaving that value on the table. Let's pull it for the shareholder owners. And they tried to take the company over. They failed in that occasion. But it shows the vulnerability of a company that doesn't have all of those arrows aligned. So we need enterprises that can align all five design traits to enable them to be generative. And so I turn this question away from big multinationals like Unilever to enterprises that you're involved in. And I invite you to look at your enterprise against this signboard and say, which of these design traits are still drawing your business back into extractive mode? Where are you caught? What's pulling you? What's holding you back? And which of these design traits already enable your enterprise to become generative? And so as part of your 10 point plan, is there anything here if you're involved in an enterprise or an organization, an institute, a university, an NGO, you can look at everything through this. Which of these design traits would you say deserve to be on that 10 point plan for transforming that design trait? And that'll enable your organization to pivot from extractive to generative. So let me wrap up. Sit your enterprise down around the donuts and ask yourself, how are we impacting? Are we bringing humanity into space or pushing us out? Where are we on the corporate to-do list? And how do we not incrementally move, but how do we leap? How can we make our enterprise regenerative by design? How can we make it distributive by design? 
And to do that, how can we look deep into the design of this organization? Do we need to change our purpose? Do we need to transform our networks? Redesign our governance? Really reshape and move our ownership? And so ensure that we bring to us the right kind of finance that enables us to be generative. The very last thing I'll say is we've set up Donut, Econ Donut Economics Action Lab to work with transformative change makers who want to bring this about, including with business. But we're very careful with business. We want businesses to use the donut in exactly the way I just described as internal ref reflection. We think it's time for businesses to reflect internally, not grab the donut and run around and put it in their marketing. They need to do the work first inside. We invite everybody to join Donut Economics Action Lab. There are amazing tools that we're co-creating with members of our community and stories of how people have been putting it into practice. So I'll stop there and really look forward to any questions that anyone wants to bring. Thank you, Kate. Uh, thanks so much for, um, for that. Uh, we've got lots of questions. They've come in very thick and fast. I, th I think there was a lot of food for thought there at the very beginning of this uh, Action Climate Lab. So, so thank you again. Okay, let's get into our first question. Um, we'll start with Joanna Bre Breely. Uh, and um, it says, hi, Kate. Oh, actually, would you like to ask your question, Joanne? Or would you like me to read it for you? I can read it out. Okay, uh, hi Kate, I'd love to know your personal opinion on B Corp movement. Are you a big fan? Or can you see um, some decent tweaks that could be made? Do you wish businesses were forced through it by government mandate? Thank you. Oh, great, great question. Okay, let me be brief. Um, I think the B Corp, uh, the, the B Corp design is a brilliant design, right? Mm -hmm. So this is people saying, hang on, this is how business is currently designed. And we can actually introduce a clause that you can write into your articles of association. It's brilliant. It's a, it's a, it's write a clause into your legal contract. And that means that shareholders can never come and say, you are not carrying out your fiduciary duty to maximize your, your returns to me, which is what so many companies fear. So it's, it's protecting yourself there. Now, the other part of that, so, so, and then let's sit with that. Okay, so B Corps have that written in. Most B Corps, if I'm correct, still are not publicly traded. So what we haven't yet seen is many examples of B Corps that are publicly traded, which I think they, they are at risk of that um, split design that I was talking about. So they've written gen regenerative purpose into their governance, but they're still going to be owned by the stock market. Now, what actually will happen in reality? I think we need to see more evidence um, of that. I also think it's very important for B Corps, they can write that into their um, governance that we're here for social and environmental value as well. But there's still the big question of how much are you generating profits for your owners and how much are you generating social and environmental value and what is it what is the appropriate um what is the appropriate mix of those and how do you hold yourself to account because you're going to be continually pulled by your owners depending on who they are they're going to pull for that financial extraction of their return so how, where is the pull in the other direction and that's where networks become incredibly important and i think the b corp movement needs to hold itself to account to make sure that the social and environmental value gets a strong a pull as the pull that's going to come from investors. And the last point she said was, should governments make this? Now that would mean that we actually change company law and section 172 of UK corporate law is far too much. Uh, if you read it, it basically says companies need to broadly maximize um, the interests of their shareholders. And other companies look at UK law and say, wow, I feel really sorry for you. The Netherlands, right? They look at it and say, wow, your corporate law is really in favor of shareholders. We've got a much more balanced corporate law. So yes, UK corporate law is leaving UK based companies um, that are their shareholder owned, very much exposed to the pull of shareholders. And we definitely need UK law to be rewritten to reflect that companies should be here to generate multiple forms of value. Financial extra Extracting financial returns is just one and, and probably not at all the most important value that a company can create. Well, thank you, Kate. Um, our next question is from Rachel Kelly. To get into the donut sweet spot, we need to get back to a culture of commons and shared abundance. Um, how do we successfully foster this in local schemes amidst uh, a culture of scarcity, limits, competition? Uh, that's the question. Great question. Okay, so. Thanks to lockdown, I have lots of cardboard cutouts. So here's one of my, here's a diagram I didn't show, but let's pop it up here, right? So the economy is a subset of society. It is just a social construct after all. 
and it's embedded in the living world. So economy, society, earth. But inside the economy, there are four fundamental ways we provision for our wants and needs. There's the market. And I've been talking about market-based enterprises that need to make a profit. So I've been talking about enterprise and business. And there's the state, which provides public goods and of course regulates. And there's the household where we all woke up every this morning, right? And we care for ourselves and our partners and our children and our parents. And there's the commons. So she just, Rachel just mentioned the commons and many people don't understand the commons, which is a tragedy because it means we neglect them. So the commons is a place where people come together, not through market exchange and not through state funding, but as a community where people co-create things that they collectively value. So I showed Drupal creating software. Those people are coming together. People aren't paying them to show up to that conference. They're coming together because they know that when they get together and create software together, they're making something much bigger than any one of them could create. And it's hugely valuable to them all. And that's the same as a neighborhood garden on the corner of your block. And that's the same as Wikipedia on the World Wide Web. So commons are hugely valuable sources of value. And we need to, and Eleanor Ostrom was the brilliant um, political scientist who put them back on the map and said, actually, they can be a triumph if we design them well and set good rules for them. So yes, here's to the commons and here's to economies that recognize the commons are a fundamental source of value. Here's to creating, just as, just as B Corps has created a design that allows you to have an enterprise that delivers social environmental return. We need a lot more legislation that protects and enables and expands the commons. So Creative Commons licensing is one example. And we've put all the tools from Donut Economics Action Lab under Creative Commons license, which means our tools and our work is in the commons. It doesn't mean it's a free for all, it means we need to protect it and people need to follow certain rules, but the rule isn't payment. Uh, and in a way, you, this, this, this webinar, it's in the gift economy. So it's a mix between the market and the commons and you're inviting people to be sensitive across those boundaries. So yes, we need the commons and Eleanor Ostrom's work on the commons is, there's some, actually there's a brilliant website called ProSocial. I think it's called prosocial.net where they tell you the eight core design traits that need to be in place for commons to work well, like um, fair costs and benefits, uh, fast um, conflict resolution, uh, shared vision. And I, anyone who wants to be part of something that you would consider in the commons, I really recommend you go to prosocial, prosocial.world, you'll find it. Uh, watch the little video there. It's a really great, we need to reskill up, right? We are commoners. We need to skill up as commoners if we want to tend to the commons well. Yeah, thank you. Um, so our next question from uh, Kate uh, for you, Kate, uh, comes from, let me see, Victoria. Uh, a key component of the move to renewable energy is battery development. As battery manufacturer is a largely, largely extractive industry, how can the regenerative versus degenerative ethos of these interlinked industries be viewed within the development of donor economics? Excellent question. <laughs> yeah, no, excellent question. So we all say, oh, you know, boo boo, oil and gas. Yay, solar panels and wind turbines. Because the, the actual energy that they generate is renewable from the, the daily income of sun and the wind. But of course, there's a, what Rachel's saying, well, where did they come from? <laughs> where did the lithium come from? Where did the metal come from? Where did the rare earth come from? And those are, of course, part of extractive industries. And Actually, you'll see more and more in the news coming up now, people saying many so the whole sort of early generation of solar panels that are coming to the end of their life. And they weren't designed to be disassembled and reused and remade. So they so solar panels as a renewable energy, the actual panels have often been made in a take, make, use, lose form. Uh, they, how do we disassemble them? So there needs to be a revolution in designing regenerative industry forms for the uh, infrastructure of renewable energy. And it's really important, uh, and the, I think for Rachel's point, one of the important takeaways is it's not okay for everyone to say, oh, I'll just get rid of my diesel car and get an electric car. Because if we just replace diesel with electric, we've still got all the metals of the cars, all the lithium going in and all the lithium mining that's happening. So that's why in the slide I showed about the circular economy, we need to move from ownership to service. So just on a very personal level, at, at the beginning of this year, we, we as a family got rid of our car not because it was broken or didn't work, it did, it was great. And it was really convenient and made my life very easy. But I now just say, I, I know too much. I cannot sit, I cannot have any integrity knowing what I know and still have that car. So we just sent it off to be dismantled and reused. And we've joined a car sharing club. 
Uh, we didn't. We said, shall we buy an electric car? No, we can't do that because we're just playing into more extractive industry. So let's let's move from ownership to service. And actually, I haven't looked back, I have to say. And when it snowed, we built a snowman right in the car park. In the <laughs> I love that. We actually did the same thing, interestingly, at the beginning of lockdown. And we haven't needed the car since. Right. And actually, everything's on foot. But it's amazing how quickly you can get used to it, isn't it? Yes. Without and actually celebrate it. Just last point in that, that. So I booked, I called the company, said, could you come and take my car away? And they said, oh yeah, we'll come next Wednesday. And then they kept calling and saying, so we can't make it Wednesday, we'll come Thursday, we can't make it, we'll come Friday. And I'm like, please just come and take it away because it's, change is always hardest just before you make it. And it was really hard. And I sat in the seat for the last time. I thought, you know, I love you car. This is my family holiday. This is driving to Dorset with my kids. This is, I, I, I'm letting go of something that actually I love, I admit it, but, and it was really hard, but then when it had gone, as soon as it had gone, hallelujah, yeah, free space, let's draw chalk pictures on the, on the pavement, let's build a snowman, and let's walk around the corner and borrow the car club and drive an electric car. So just to anyone who's thinking about change and it's really hard, I really believe change is hardest just before you make it, and once you're on the other side of it, you think, why did that take me so long? Yeah, it's amazing how adaptive we, we really are, yes. I think. Um, so Thomas, the next question is from Thomas. How do we get from current global hypercapitalism to a global donut economy? The vested interests are big. Um, they have a lot of money and a lot of influence on politics, media and the like. How do we overcome their opposition? Thanks for the little question, Thomas. I like the little ones like that, you know. <laughs> um, how? By doing it just by starting and doing it. That's, I mean, I really believe that there are billions of change makers around the world who, who are already in action uh, or will jump into action as soon as they see a clear route of something, think, aha, that is worth channeling my energy and that is worth building a commons around, building a community around and let's go. So the reason why we've set up Donate Economics Action Lab and this is just a tiny part of a much bigger movement of change, but I can only speak from my experience. So published Donut Economics in 2017, and I spent two years going around, talk, 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 and event, event, think, come on, enough talking, who actually wants to do this? And after every talk, there'll be people coming up to me saying, I'm a teacher, I want to teach this, I run a business, I want to do this, I'm a town councillor, I'm a community organiser, and I think these change makers are everywhere. So we thought, right, let's set up Donut Economics Action Lab. Anyone can join, and it features the ideas and the tools that community members are making, and the most inspiring thing is not somebody standing on the stage talking theory. The most inspiring thing is somebody just like yourself, maybe it's a teacher like your teacher or a mayor or a school child or a business leader or a CEO or a new graduate or sustainability officer or counselor, but somebody just like you who's already doing that thing that you thought was impossible, but oh look, they're, they're doing it. That is what inspires people. So I believe that one of the powerful ways of making this change happen this decade is to put irresistible ideas out there make them accessible to people, give people permission to pick them up and run with it without waiting for someone to say, yes, you can, because you just can, it's in the commons. And then to show each other those inspirations. So the city of Amsterdam adopted the donut in April last year and it, the Guardian wrote about it and it went boom. And instantly cities around the world and in the UK and in the Netherlands and in Kuala Lumpur and in Australia and New Zealand, suddenly saying, what the, oh, what? we want to do this now. I can stand on a stage all I like and say, hey, we could live in the donut. It's when the deputy mayor of Amsterdam says, well, obviously this is the vision we want for our city because it holds everything we want to be. That's what enables change to happen. So I don't know how to get rid of all the vested interests and the old way of thinking. What I do know is that we need to bring up the new, right? It, it, some people need to be focused on being against. We need to shut things down. We need to block bridges. We need to protest. We need to point out what's wrong with the old, but it, you, you will never change things only by doing that. There has to be something to go to. So we have to also articulate what we're for and show the vision of what we're for and show it in practice and make it irresistible and everybody wants to join the party. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that, moving towards, where to move towards, not just yeah. what we're moving away from. Yes. Uh, thank you again so much, Kate. We've got a lot more questions in the chat, so maybe it's possible to, 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 you know, to look at those later or to pull, forward them on. But um, uh, Alicia would like to join us again um, now, if, if you're you. there, Alicia. Great. Yes, lovely. Kate, that was, as ever, a complete inspiration. And um, I'd like to say a huge thank you for joining us today. 
and I really hope that we're going to see you at Hawkwood soon. I think we have plans in due course for you to come and stay with your team and um, so you can do your own action on your action labs. And it has actually your action labs of what in, have inspired this climate action lab. So oh, there brilliant. we go. It's a beautiful flow through on that. Yeah. Well, the huge thank if I can you. just say the lovely thing about the word action. I, I never wanted to set up an organization, but when I came across the idea of Donut Economics Action Lab, it felt OK because it's about action. Yeah. And lab means it's an experiment and we're learning and things work and don't work and it's all learning. So it feels playful and open and evolving. So here's your action. That's right. That's right. Yeah, we're all learning all the time.